Welcome to Weird Web Radio, an explorer's guide to hidden worlds of the paranormal and occult, reality expanding experiences, and the downright weird and bizarre. With your host, Lonnie Scott. Welcome to Weird Web Radio. I'm your host, Lonnie Scott. This episode features one of my fellow co authors of the L Has a Blaze. Compendium of Chaos Heathenry Anthology, Heimlich A. Laguz. You can check out more of Heimlich's writings at lhasablaze.com, and you can always find our book available in both Kindle and paperback format at amazon.com. Heimlich and I cover a pretty good range of topics here. Uh, we dig into all sorts of things, like how he got into magic, runes, what it means to worship mystery, his encounters with spirits and ghosts, possibilities of possession, what he does with runes, and so much more. And I think you're really going to enjoy this. As always, you can be a big help to the show by subscribing and rating Weird Web Radio on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or any app where you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let the world know what you like and show some love. Share the show on your social media to get the word out to everyone. In fact, even get out there on Reddit and start arguments about how Weird Web Radio is the show people should be listening to. You can also gain access to bonus audio sessions with the guests along with all the other fun rewards by joining the membership. Just go to patreon.com slash weirdwebradio or weirdwebradio.com and click join the membership. It only takes $5 a month to get started. That's less than I paid for the caramel macchiato that I'm enjoying right now as I do this audio session. The funding that you give helps keep this show going and it helps keep us achieving more and more goals and growing. Looking for more insight into your life? Ready to get answers to questions that are keeping you up at night? And maybe you just need direction. I'm also an international award-winning tarot reader and you can go to tarotheathen.com to reserve your reading today. The link to get a reading is available at weirdwebradio.com along the sidebar. I hope you're all ready to go on an insightful and magical journey. Open your eyes, open your mind, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show, my friends. Stay weird out there. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to Weird Web Radio. Tonight, we have a very special guest, Heimlich A. Laguz. Welcome to the show. Thanks. It's really, really cool to have you here. Um, if people don't know, just to give you a quick little background, um, Heimlich and I have been associated as friends and co-conspirators in the world of chaos heathenry now for, oh boy, would you venture to say nearly 10 years? Wow, we're getting off money. <laughs> yeah, I think that's about the right number. I can't remember if it was in 2007 or 8, perhaps, that I found my way to com and discovered that I wasn't the only one struggling with how to be both a chaos magician and a heathen at the same time. In fact, when I found you guys, I realized it wasn't even a struggle anymore. It was this beautiful expression of just how to work magic and have this spiritual foundation as well. And I owed a lot of credit to who I am and who I became to, you know, you specifically in the writing you provided. And of course, someday I reach out through email, we become quick friends, and it led to us creating this anthology that we've put out, El Has a Blaze, a compendium of chaos heathenry. So I guess what everybody really wants to know <laughs> is a sort of chicken and an egg story for you what came first? Were you a chaos magician first or were you a heathen first? And how did you find your way into it? Mm, yeah, well, um, so when I was 16, I first encountered people who called themselves Wiccans. Um, with the benefit of hindsight, I really don't know how Wiccan they really were, but they were interested in weird occult kind of stuff. Um, and it was all very interesting. And also, I remember distinctly having the thought, if this is all there is of magic in the world, then the world is a pretty sad place. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad. And, um, you know, and they were doing a lot of that stuff of like, oh, I'm going to magically attack you. And 
Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, just a lot of that kind of dumb bullshit that people do that. Uh, what, what, what does a magical attack look like whenever they say that? You know, I'm not even totally sure. Um, I, think, <laughs> I think a lot of drama and um, yeah, that's probably the main essence. And the opportunity <laughs> to complain about somebody who isn't present and the terrible things that they supposedly did. You know, all those bad habits that occultists get into. That was kind of uh, some of what I saw. Um, and then, but also had some really interesting, unsettling experiences. Um, I had an encounter with uh, what I think was the Grim Reaper uh, one night in a McDonald's of all places. Um, in fact, um, I was sitting in this McDonald's. Uh, it was where all the cool kids used to hang out. And uh, I just, in walks this Grim Reaper. I just kind of hallucinated this being and just came in and it uh, came and kind of stood around our table for quite a while. It was very unsettling. Um, so I had odd experiences like that. Um, um, anyway, so kind of fast forward a little bit through to like, like maybe 18 and uh, I got to, I went into undergraduate um, university University of Sydney, and I was studying uh, philosophy and psychology, and I met various people who were interested in occultism and also heathenry. And by this point, I knew I was interested in the occult, um, but I didn't really have a good in in terms of like what I wanted it to be for me. But I had played a little bit with runes, and I had read the awful Ralph Bloom book, as I now believe is awful. At the time, it seemed like you know, sure, why not? Um, but I met some folks who were interested in heathenry, and uh, one gentleman in particular was very much interested in rune magic, and he was very much uh, kind of into the idea that religion and magic should, could uh, be kind of mixed up together. And so he said to me, you know, if you want to get into this stuff, it's not a bad idea to learn about the basics of magic. So he loaned me a copy of a little obscure book by Phil Hine called Condensed Chaos. Excellent and, book. Oh my God, what a book. I mean, Phil Hine, mm. I know Phil Hine doesn't really do the chaos magic thing anymore, but we all owe him such a debt, I really think. I mean, uh, I absolutely agree. Just uh, amazing. So, um, so for me, heathenry and chaos magic kind of arrived about the same time and from the same source. And they've therefore always had this interconnection for me. Um, and I started working with the runes and I discovered very early on that I felt a really intense kinship with uh, the figure of Odin as the ecstatic shaman poet and healer and the necromantic uh, oracle, if you like. Um, and I fell in love with the idea of worshipping mystery um, and the idea that rune means mystery that just became more and more interesting over time uh, and still, still was kind of a cornerstone really of kind of my whole worldview. Um, the embrace of mystery, which uh, necessarily implies the embrace of vulnerability and the shedding of ego, um, and the embrace of some kind of union with that, which is the opposite to what I think I am. Um, which I think of as kind of reverence. Um, so that's kind of where it all began. And that's kind of why the two things, chaos magic and heathenry, have always been connected to me. I guess I've always seen Odin as a kind of chaos magician. Um right just a culturally and yeah, a culturally specific one. So I, yeah. I you say Odin, you see Odin as a chaos magician. I, I'm inclined to agree, but I can't let a comment like that just come out and then keep going. <laughs> <laughs> what makes Odin a, a chaos magician? You know, I think it's his playfulness. When you look at the descriptions of how he deals with, battles of wit it's very clear that um there's a kind of a lightness and a sense of irony um that he has um 
so that he uses manipulation and deceit in a certain kind of way. He plays psychological games, and often his foes are much more literal, and they may be very wise or knowledgeable, but they don't have that nimbleness of thought that he has. Um, and I think of chaos magic as being very much about nimbleness of thought. You know, the idea that belief is not an end in itself, it's a tool that I can use to experience a different state of consciousness. Um, uh, that idea to me is very Odinic. Um, there's a certain kind of playful non-attachment and adventurousness to it. Um, Sven Plowright, uh, Plowright writes in his book True Helm about the idea of the image of the berserker, and he talks about how is the you know a berserker can't wear armor and go berserk. They didn't wear armor; they fought naked, in fact. And this idea that there's that vulnerability that is necessary to unleash this kind of preternatural um, ability to kill, <laughs> you know, this, this <laughs> right. um, and, but he uses that as a metaphor as well, you know, for, you know, releasing the armor of self or the armor of ego, um, the armor of belief um, so that there can be a spontaneity that can uh, then emerge. And yeah, Odin, chaos magic, spontaneity. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. I, I, I can't find anything to argue with in that. Now, you you mentioned um, Ralph Bloom. Now, of course, he's probably how some people got involved in runes. And honestly, as as bad as it has like any historical value as a chaos magician, you use what you use, right? Yeah. Now, you said uh, Phil Hine, of course, was another influence. Who would you count as some of your other early influences when you were getting involved into the occult? Uh, well, Sven uh, Plowright, uh, who I already mentioned, uh, who, apart from being a, bra- a great author, author is someone who I've known pretty much since the beginning of my engagement with Heathenry and um, got closer and closer with him over time. So he was certainly a, an important mentor and he really challenged me in a lot of ways and in very positive ways. He kind of really forced me to question myself and to try and cultivate a more balanced understanding of um heathenry and what it means to be a reconstructionist what it means to embrace um new innovation how you can maybe harmonize the two um having a sense of irony about belief you know so a lot a lot of these things um you know he, he was an important influence for me and continues to be you know um the fact that he contributed a chapter to our book and he's written for the for the el hazablaze website i mean all these things it's wonderful it's amazing um to you know, have worked with him as a peer at this point. Um, other influences: um, Jan Fries, who wrote Saithways and Hellruna and Visual Magic. Um, and as much as his interpretation of Saith has been ripped to shreds from a historical veracity kind of point of view, nevertheless, I think his understanding of the physiological processes that are involved in altered states of consciousness and the neurology. Not that he gets into neurology as a scientist, but kind of applied neurology, if you like. Um, the guy really um, hit the nail on the head repeatedly. And his emphasis, again, on playfulness, lightness, um, improvisation. You know, I think in visual magic, he says something like on the back cover, it says something like, you know, if you're, if you're the kind of person that wants to sit in an armchair, then this isn't the book for you. you know, if you're <laughs> the kind of person that wants to climb a tree, this is the book for you. Um, so that was um, a big thing for me. That came a little bit later. In some ways, his work was more like reading verification that what I had already been thinking was actually a valid thing. Um, um, of course, I, I did um, read Edward Thorson's stuff. I was in the Rune Guild for a little while. Um, ultimately, I've come to regard Thorson as pretty problematic. I think he's whole obsession with the ego and this idea of like, I'm going to be a God and live forever, which to me is um, just ridiculous. Like I think that we already are all gods. So what are you trying to make live forever? You know, it's um, um, yeah, a lot of stuff, you know, a lot of his work was trying to establish rune magic on some, some kind of academically sound basis, which was a very admirable goal. And also he made up an awful lot of stuff and pretended though it had some kind of basis. And I I wasted years trying to sort through all that tangle of confusion. So, um, um, you you know, I have a lot of criticisms. Um, 
and you know he did get the ball rolling he gets he definitely gets the credit for getting something good started but uh yeah i you know i would say that um is and my apologies for interrupting there but yeah. with when it comes to edred he is a problematic figure for a lot of various reasons. I've even had my own debates with the man, uh, and I can't sit here and say I don't owe him a great deal of credit either. Yeah. Because when it comes to modern esoteric runic practice, which is what I call it, uh, I don't care if an author says it's ancient or not. We've got no evidence for it. Um, but I, I don't know where you wouldn't find his stamp on something that's written today. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, I think the thing with him that ultimately, um, I mean, apart from a, a personal dealing that I uh, had with him where he was proved himself to be a pretty problematic dude, but, um, um, but quite aside from that, um, when I was reading his books and trying to build the confidence to explore this thing called magic, I found his books to be very discouraging because the whole tone and theme of them basically communicates this idea that unless you already are a master of the runes, you can do nothing. And if you want to do this kind of magic to create this effect, well, you're going to have to memorize 10 pages of the poetry that I wrote, I, Edward Thorson, and, uh, and then maybe, you know, blah, 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 blah. It just takes all the spontaneity and life and the numinosity out of it. Um, so as I began to get more frustrated with that, I ended up embracing that spontaneity. Um, and at the same time, really just going back to the primary sources myself from the academic material and realizing that uh, there was a lot more to it and a lot more subtleties, a lot more richness that I had missed out when I was more stuck with his framework. And likewise, um, part of my disillusionment came from this realization that I didn't truly feel that working in the the Rune Guild way was actually helping me to connect with the runes in a truly deep way or to connect with Odin or what Odin represents in a truly deep way. I felt like it was kind of shallow after a point and I had to go my own path. So insofar as it gave me a uh, impetus to go my own path, wonderful. Um, but uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, pretty, when, when pretty you turn to the sources and you go looking for that more spontaneous, spontaneity um the more numinous idea of magic and i you know and i agree i can see the draw to that and i find a lot of value in myself um i wouldn't go as far as you have with the criticisms of edred um mm -hmm. but uh i i would say that much of his material is very more ritual based and if that's your thing i think you'd love it um more chaos magic themed mag uh, approaches probably not so much right. so when you go well, looking for that more raw sort of source where did you find it i found it in the eras i found it in reading academic books about archaeology uh runic amulets and magic objects um which is such a, a fun just perplexing fascinating book um the writings of bill Lindsay, um who his stuff is just like pdfs you find it online drinking from the well of mimir is one of his books just brilliant um paul boschatz his book the well on the tree was like a crucial thing for me um so more the academic stuff um because when you actually look at the historical record you start to realize that um these people were kind of making it up as they went along too and they had a sense of humor um, and they had a kind of immediacy, you know, some of these old runic inscriptions, there's a real immediacy and passion, um, uh, to them. And that's what I want to kind of pick up on, you know? So, um, yeah. So like these days I don't really read occult books about runes anymore. I read academic material, uh, you know, um, and then I, I try to draw inspiration from that you know, in the way that artists have from mythology since as long as there's been mythology. Um, and if there's an art to magic, then maybe that's part of that process. Um, yeah. Well, well, speaking of magic, since we've thrown that word around a few times, mm -hmm. 
when did you know for sure that this was something that you should pursue, that you finally had evidence in your hand and it was time to go deeper? What happened? Yeah. Yep, I was uh, I was maybe 19 years old, and I decided once and for all I was going to demonstrate for myself whether magic worked or not. And I cast a spell to change the color of my eyes, and they promptly changed color. And they remained that way for three days, and people commented on how I suddenly looked different and how bizarre it was. And, oh, my God, you really do have different color eyes. What the heck happened there? <laughs> um, as in, like, not me being like, hey, look. My, you know, like prompting them. Like people just been like, you don't have, since when did you have dark green eyes? Well, what's going on here? Kind of thing. Um, that was the decisive thing for me. Um, and then I had other experiences since. I mean, I've struggled often with the psychic sensor, the disbelief in magic, or else that negative self-talk that says, even if magic's real, maybe I just can't do it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's something that maybe... Um, I wish people would talk about more. In fact, I wish I would talk about it more. In fact, I think I should write an L has a blaze article about <laughs> self belief and how um, you know that how deadening that can be. Um, whereas these days, I guess I've just done so much magic now that it's like um, I don't even think about it. I don't even bother to track if a spell works or not anymore. I just assume that whatever is going to be the best outcome is is going to come. And uh, that if I don't get the outcome I asked for, it's only because uh, I, my unconscious mind thought of something better. Um, and uh, so, but it is interesting. My hit rate's pretty good. I think I, I typically will fire, just keep my hand in, I'll fire off a sigil kind of magic spell once a week, just here or there. But I would say the last couple of months, every week, I get the thing I asked for. So, I mean, that's pretty good, actually, now I think about it. I would say that's very good. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's funny too. I like to reference like a comment I saw through away by a friend of mine on Facebook uh, that that maybe we don't expect enough out of magic, and here you are coming right out of the gate. I changed my eye color. (laughs) Yeah, that's funny. You know, like just even talking about this now, I just think like God, it was almost like I was so naive that it played to my benefit. You know. I just had no preconceptions. That beginner's mind they talk about in Zen Buddhism. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I'd thought about it, I might not have been able to do it. Done it, you know. Well, let's um, let's back up a minute and talk about what you do when you have that self doubt and you start to question yourself. Even with you, as you say, you've been quite successful. Um, the hit rate has gone well for you, but the doubt still comes in and says maybe this isn't real. What do you do when that happens? Um, honestly, um, I just welcome the thought. It's just a thought. It's like any other thought. There's no point fighting with thoughts. Usually what you fight just gets stronger, whether that's thoughts or anything else. You know, we become the things that we fear or reject or hate or disown. The thoughts can just be there. Hello, thought. There's a thought. You know, objectify the thought as thought. And then go back to what I'm doing, you know. So... And that's a very kind of, I suppose, um, um, Buddhist or maybe Taoist kind of approach, you know, just to acknowledge and then accept and then just go back to whatever my point of reference was, my focus. Um, Yeah, so I just don't fight it anymore. And so, therefore, it has nothing to push against. No, that's a smart, wise approach. It's easy to say that. You're right. (laughs) Years of self-work. You know, and, and I definitely have a work ethic when it comes to self-work. But, yeah, there, there's a lightness there. You know, and, and, and I work a lot with, you know, I'm constantly working with um, my breathing patterns and making, you know, micro adjustments um, just from years of working with breath and uh, meditation practice and um, uh, laughing at myself. Humor is a very powerful tool for dismantling of those kind of negative ideas. Um, um, I use a lot of nonviolent communication with myself these days. That's become more and more a cornerstone of what I do, which really can get me out of all kinds of horrible binds. Um, people don't think of nonviolent communication as being a tool for working within oneself. But when you look at it, that's the bedrock of the whole thing is if I don't have good communication with myself, I'm unlikely to have good communication with others. So 
that's where I want to invest in energy is learning how to actually listen to myself. Um, so that's, that's a big thing for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's a big collection of things for me. That's, that settles that. <laughs> now, uh, heathen is another term we keep throwing around since we've begun this. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I think heathen means something different to a lot of people, even those of us who call ourselves heathen. Yeah. So f- to you, what what defines the boundaries of a heathen? How would you say this is heathen? Yeah, Um So I guess to me, the word has two meanings. Um, The first is a historical anthropological meaning, um, specifically referring to a number of cultures from Northern Europe um, and their cultural organization, mythology, beliefs, technology, um, cultural practices, languages, um, um, and some of the commonalities between those groups, sort of polytheistic, maybe animistic cultures um, that were quite diverse and complicated um, and that, uh, you know, gradually became first Romanized and then Christianized. Um, um, And, you know, we have these remnants of mythology from those people and we have remnants of archeology span from those people, remnants of language. so, though, so firstly, you know, using it as a very, very kind of broad umbrella term for a very kind of polyglot mixture of cultures. Um, um, and then uh, secondly, as a modern uh, kind of uh, cultural label, I suppose, which is, you know, um, I think of myself as when I say I, if I were to call myself heathen, what I mean by that is that I am, drawn to those remnants of those ancient peoples and there's something in those remnants that um speaks to a kind of a will to live and a joy and a mystery for me and there's something nourishing about that and so i feel drawn to try and reactivate that in some way knowing that it's not going to look anything like what it did back in the day but um um but it gives me a kind of a, a mythological language to make sense of myself in a lot of ways. Um, and that goes deeper into that because it goes into my personal, like, for example, I feel like I have a personal relationship with the god Odin. And I have for a long time. And it's complex and interesting. And it challenges me and it causes me to grow. And I've had some beautiful experiences as a result of that. So, um, in some ways for me, being heathen, um, is specific to me just as it would be to someone else. Um, um, one piece of that, that I think is important though, is, um, when we look at the past, it's very easy to project our modern worldview onto the past and actually if you're really looking at the past, you should be getting a sense of culture shock. So um, for me, um, some people talk about heathenry as like, oh, this is just intuitive to me when I look at this old stuff. And I kind of question that. I kind of wonder if those people are really tearing off the blinders of their received kind of opinions and really looking at this old stuff. Because when you really look at this old stuff, it's pretty weird. Like those people were pretty weird in terms of modern Western assumptions, post-Christian assumptions. Um, they had pretty weird ideas about relationships and time, gender, um, politics, uh, social organization, power, love. Um, so, uh, you know, the oneness and difference of all things, if you like, interconnection and the structure of the cosmos, poetry, poetry, had completely different meaning for those people. I mean, they weren't even a, a, a written culture. There was essentially an oral culture. So right away, when, when you or I pick up a copy of the Edda and we read the Havamal, like no one was reading the Havamal back in there. People were memorizing <laughs> speaking it. And so, 
um, that changes everything irrevocably. You know? So um, um, that's one thing that I think is really important is, is you know, am I experiencing a sense of culture shock when I approach this material? If I'm not, then I'm probably seeing it through a thick lens and uh, I would like to shed as much of that lens as I can. That is a very good answer. Um, if someone was coming to you and saying they wanted to explore heathenry today, I mean, what sort of advice would you give them? Think for yourself, question authority. <laughs> what, Tim Leary? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, read lots of academic stuff. Um, learn about what modern authors have come up with, learn how to critique it, learn to understand what's wrong with relying on a lot of the 19th century academics and all of their weird stuff. You know, a lot of heathens still rely on like Grombeck and all those people, even though it's totally wrong and awful. Um, um, challenge the politicization of heathenry, the people that want to use it as an excuse for racism or stuff like that or sexism or homophobia because it's not really... I mean, you look at the material of what's left over from those cultures and it doesn't really jive. But people will try to convince themselves it does. Um, oh, well. Um, yeah, so be critical of that stuff. Uh, read a lot. Get lots of opinions. Uh, refrain from buying into anything too quickly. Um and then ask the gods and ask the spirits and ask the ancestors and, you know, dial direct and then have a sense of humor about whatever they tell you, you know. Yeah. Go out and buy a copy of El Has a Blaze. <laughs> buy a copy of El Has a Blaze. Um, yeah. Oh, and learn about historiography, right? So, like, people take something like, say, the Icelandic sagas and they're like, look, this is what these people believed and how they saw the world, right? Mm -hmm. And then you start looking at, historiography and academics who spend hundreds and millions of hours really trying to make sense of the context of these books and pointing out like, Oh, this whole plot arc and Eagle saga. Well, you see that in lots of uh, Mediterranean Christian texts and someone just pretty much plonked it wholesale into Eagle saga. And now people think that that's how they did rune magic and probably wasn't, you know, stuff like that. So you really got to be very critically minded and not take things at face value. Now the problem with that is you end up with very little that you can lean on. And so you also have to have a sense of humor about that and acceptance. Um, um, that's just what we've got. It's interesting when um, I have a little bit of interest in um, Roman paganism and uh, I was doing some research on the goddess Minerva. And um, it's interesting because if you want to learn about the goddess Minerva, well, the Romans were a literate culture. So they wrote all this stuff down about the goddess Minerva. You just go and read it and they'll tell you exactly when they worshiped her and what they did. Um, I mean, it's not as simple as that, of course, because actually <laughs> yeah, history is always more complicated than that. But relative to what we have with the heathen materials, it's, it's another world. So we have to accept that and have a sense of humor and playfulness. Um, otherwise, we just have to give up. And that's not acceptable to me. So. Well, uh, talking about having a sense of humor and playfulness, I mean... And those those are a couple of phrases that you you bring up more than once, and often in reference to runes and magic, uh, in your research going back into them. Yeah. So, I mean, hmm. when's the time that the runes like really surprised you when you were <laughs> using them? So yeah, there was a period. Um, uh, this is quite a few years ago. Let me think. This would be like. <laughs> like 15 years ago now well a period where i was extremely active magically and um i was doing a lot of work with using the runes for divination and um at one point i sat down with them on a whim or an impulse or something and i said to the runes if it were to my ultimate benefit would you lie to me and they said yes and I put them away and I didn't look at them for about three months. <laughs> they were fucking with me. <laughs> um, now, 
to me, I would have a very different reaction. I'd just be like, oh, okay. Um, I'm a lot less attached. Um, but that was certainly an interesting experience. I've had some interesting experiences working with the god Loki as well. Um, I've learned with Loki that the more serious you are, the more it punishes you, and the more light you are, the more it rewards you. Um, so he's really taught me some valuable lessons about being light and being gentle, and being playful. You know, and uh, yeah, and being being disciplined about avoiding <laughs> resentment and um, and uh, self pity. Loki catches a lot of bad press. In fact, uh, Loki's a hot button issue for um, some things that I've been working on right now uh, as part of my role on the high read of the troth. And um, why do you think Loki has such a bad image with a whole entire section of heathenry, especially here in America? There is a German and Dutch folkloric figure called Till Elenspiegel. I think I pronounced that right. Um, Al Mirror. And he was like, a, I think, a 13th century kind of court jester type character. But I see him as very, very Loki-ish, like a kind of a, some kind of a similar kind of thing, some leftover of Loki that kind of continued to lurk in continental Europe. And uh, the idea is that he kind of, he holds a mirror up to you and you may not like what you see. I think that's an important piece of what Loki does is he holds up mirrors to people. There's a lot of people that don't want to see themselves. They're afraid. Um, they want that to go away. And uh, Loki is pretty ruthless and relentless in challenging people. So it's easy to demonize him. If I have demonized a part of myself, I can project that onto Loki and say, oh, Loki is so bad. So that's part of it. The other part is that... Um, you know, you look at the myths and uh, um, there are some kind of leaps of inference that, again, these 19th century academics mostly made about uh, Loki's role in Ragnarok and things like that, which don't necessarily stand up. Um, and more to the point, just the fact that the mythology is cyclical. I mean, Ragnarok has an important purpose. It leads to the total rebirth of the world. So, you know, um, that's important. I, I think of Loki as being like the, the horribly beaten up conscience of the whole mythology. Um, and eventually everything goes horribly wrong because of that. Uh, so, you know, um, there's a, there, oh, here we go. Chaos magic, right? So, um, Pete Carroll says a God denied is a demon born. That's Loki. <laughs> um, you get what you ask for with Loki and people ask for negativity because they don't want to look at themselves and that's what they get. I, I think you're onto something there, but when you say he's the conscience of the mythology, that's an interesting phrase. Uh, why do you choose conscience to describe him? Because the gods are all hypocrites. They're all liars and schemers and double dealers and Odin breaks oaths, you know, a dime a dozen. And they all like, you you know, they're, they're, they're scumbags, really. I mean, just like the <laughs> Greek gods, like, you know, and I don't say this isn't like, oh, so they're bad or anything like that. I love, you know, I love him. You know, I mean, Odin, as far as I'm concerned, he's it for me. Like, like he's, he's, he's star, you know, um, but you can't deny that the guy's an oathbreaker and a backstabber and, you know, there's all this, you know, lets his favorite heroes die on the battlefield and, you know, the, the lesser, uh, you know, the, the, the lesser combatant wins. You know, he's fickle. Um, so Loki is the one who's willing to point this stuff out and name it. And um, I suspect that the ancient heathens probably were pretty accepting of uh, the excesses of their gods, just as the... Uh, you know, the Greeks and the Romans were to a point uh, until Christian, Christianization in later Rome, pagan Rome, started to kind of uh, undermine that. Um, you know, because these narratives are these fallible, conniving, flawed beings, that's, that's, there's truth, you know, there's truth in that. Um, and we don't have to take away from all their beauty and grace and wonder just for the fact of the fact that they, you know, do despicable things at times. Um, just as no human being is perfect and just as um, we don't have to throw away the beauty of a human being just because they have flaws. So um, maybe that's the other problem uh, that maybe modern heathens have with Loki is a kind of uh, perfectionism, um, a ridiculous kind of perfectionism. We want Odin to be squeaky, keen, squeaky clean, even though he's the god of slaughter. 
um, and, uh, you, you know, engages in ergy and uh, um, murder and, and is inconsistent and breaks oaths at points and so forth. Um, but we want him to be squeaky clean. But Loki, <laughs> we can put it all on him. But, of course, the two are blood brothers. So what does that tell you? All right. And that is always a point that someone will throw into those conversations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Going. I think Odin's way to the shadow. Yeah. Going even beyond uh, the gods, uh, you brought up worshiping mystery and mm-hmm. rune meaning mystery and how intriguing all of that was. Yeah. What does that look like in your in your life and in your practice? How does one worship or work with mystery? Um, it requires a constant dismantling of belief and expectation. I think the sense of humor is a part of that and the sense of irony. Um, um, there's a constant process of checks and balances, reminding oneself of the limits of one's conscious narrative consciousness, um, uh, really working very hard to never reject anything uh, on impulse, um, which takes some strength. Um, um, because I'm often wrong. And no one can honestly say that they aren't often wrong. So the simple acknowledgement of that is automatically worshipping mystery. Um and yet, even though I'm often wrong, I still have to make choices every day and um, sometimes high stakes choices. So, you know, we all have to do that. We all have to make um, difficult choices with not enough time and not enough information. And we do, we do that every day constantly. Um, and we become desensitized to that reality. Um, and then when we do realize that we get freaked out. So to be comfortable with that, to not need to desensitize myself, to be able to embrace that. Um, kind of trust, I suppose. What led to the writings and work behind El Has a Blaze? Why even choose the name El Has a Blaze in the birth of Chaos Heathenism? Hmm. Um, I suppose for me that El Has Rune, the Anglo Saxon Rune poem, kind of talks about um, the swamp which the swamp was, seems to have been like a very kind of liminal, magical place to the ancient heathens. They would make a lot of offerings in swamps and bogs, maybe because it's neither land nor sea, it's in between. Um, but the rune also references, you know, these um, tough bladed grass at the edge of the swamp that you can cut yourself on. So there's this idea of like a boundary or, or, or kind of a safety there. Um, so there's a mixture of the vulnerability, the magic and the mystery, but also appropriate boundaries. Um, and um, I like that duality and the way that transcends duality. Um, so to me, El has kind of has this invitation um, to go into an altered realm. And then the ablaze, I suppose, um, I'm going to kind of retcon this, but um, if El has kind of has this watery kind of vibe, um, a fire and water are, um, is kind of this, duality for me that's very important and and so maybe the ablaze is simply you know fire and water both getting their acknowledgement Um, fire and water doesn't really come necessarily from heathenry it comes from my own personal just weird experiences but um i mean it is a motif that surfaces in heathen mythology and many other traditions and um yeah has a kind of personal significance that is Probably more than I can explain in this conversation. <laughs> Fair enough. So, El has a blood. Very long uh, uh, article on the El has website about fire and water. If you want to know, you can look that up. Okay. Yeah. Now, El has a blaze dot com is launched, and you begin writing, um, not alone, but you begin writing about chaos heathenism this brand new sort of marriage of ideas philosophies under this title that uh, before that, I don't think anyone had ever bridged the two, not in a way that you hadn't, you had done anyway. So Mm. 
Why was it necessary, do you think? You know, um, honestly, I have a copy of our book here. I want to read a little bit of the back of cover because it kind of sums it up. Good. Um, there are those who hear the phrase chaos heathen and instinctively know what it means. This book is for you. There are those who hear the phrase chaos heathen and do not know what that could mean. This book is for you. There are those who hear the phrase chaos heathen and get upset, confused, or angry. This book is for you. Sometimes I will say to someone the phrase chaos heathenry or chaos heathen, and they'll just be like, oh yeah, totally. Yep. Got it. (laughs) We're out there. We already exist. I don't really think I invented anything. Um, Maybe I came up with a a word for it, but, you know, we've been around where we exist. Um, And I think we have something to offer everybody else as well. Um, So that's why I see the book as being for everybody, even if you're kind of like, oh, that's a horrible idea. You (laughs) you have an opportunity to explore then, you know. Um, Yeah. What, why we exist, what we are, I don't know. That one, that one I can't tell you. But Well, I think in each individual who would uh, be find themselves attracted to the idea is the ideas of chaos heathen, heathenry um, probably has their own reasons for finding their way there and what they resonate mm-hmm. with. Uh, I think it's clear from the anthology now, especially that we don't all always think alike on the same issues. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I know for myself, I always describe when people ask me exactly what I mean by chaos, heathen, I say, you know, um, heathenry is the spiritual harbor from which I sail and go explore all the magical possibilities I can find, wanting only that which actually works and bringing it back home and improving my heathenry. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, yeah, yeah, I, you know, and, and I look at, you know, so some of the things that have influenced me, uh, Taoism and Buddhism and Hinduism, Sufism, um, and I see these profound points of connection with those traditions and some of the stuff that you see in heathenry. Um, um, so I would be dishonest to deny the potency of those things. Um or to pretend they don't speak to me. It would just be, I'd just be lying, you know. So why would I want to do that? So therefore, chaos even. You know, chaos magic is about the idea that you can draw connection from parallels between traditions. Um, you can. Uh, does that mean they're all equivalent and all comparisons are always valid? No, but that doesn't mean that you can't do it or that it might not be fruitful or that sometimes it is valid. Or even if it isn't valid, maybe you still got a good idea that made your life better. So putting all of that aside for now, (laughs) we have come to the part of the show where I like to dig into more paranormal topics. Okay. My favorite part about this is especially when I have people like yourself who are more occult practitioners and talking about what you might do if you're in a haunted place or experience a haunting yourself. So without further ado, Heimlich Lagoos, have you, sir ever encountered a haunting yeah definitely (laughs) i love the enthusiasm do tell (laughs) yeah yeah um i've had a number of weird experiences um probably i've forgotten a number of them as well unfortunately (laughs) but um um, uh, okay so i can give you an example um this is an old one this goes back years but it's kind of an interesting one um i was falling asleep one night and i was in that kind of hypnagogic state kind of not quite asleep, but not quite awake, kind of in dreamland, but still sort of conscious. And then there was a voice in my head. Um, and it was a very loud voice. It was so loud that it actually drowned out my own voice in my head. And it was kind of screaming and shouting, which was very frightening. And then the next thing I knew my sense of perspective was that I was kind of floating in the air, looking down at myself and I'm looking down at myself 
and then I see my eyes open and I'm looking up at myself as I'm looking down at myself. And the me that's on in bed looking up suddenly gives this really nasty big smirk and I suddenly realize like, oh, that's not me in my body. I'm not in my body. I got evicted from my body. That's something else. Oh, no. So, um, I, I don't exactly know how I figured out why to do this or it was just instinct or desperation. Um, I decided to try and like condense myself into as small and dense a unit of consciousness as I could. And I somehow managed to get into, um, back into my hand. And once I was in my hand, I had a finger and with the finger, I traced a little hammer of Thor. And the minute I did that, my body went into convulsions and this thing that had kind of taken over, did not like Thor. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of sort of, you know, Thor drives off giants and sets boundaries and, you know, defender kind of thing, fights off, uh, you know, the otherworldly uh, beasts. So um, I think that was why I, I did a hammer of Thor. But um, then I got fully into my hand and then I was able to do that again. And each time I did it, I got more of my body back. And the thing was still screaming in my mind and screaming at me. And I was kind of like thrashing around. And then, bang, I was back into my body, and it was gone. And I was, like, soaked in sweat. I remember that very clearly. It was, like, yeah, a very unpleasant experience. Um, and I think that I've often been, had very porous, porous boundaries. Um, when I was, you know, still to some degree today, I was kind of a pushover interpersonally, but also magically. Um uh, so, um, yeah, this thing took its opportunity. Uh, luckily I was, turns out pretty good at magical combat. So, yeah. Are you saying that, um, you, you're porous, I believe was the word you used. So you've yeah. experienced, uh, possession against your will at other times. Um, I've, I've had things try to take me. And um, um, I did get trapped in a kind of another world, or I don't know how to explain it exactly, but I got stuck in this sort of um, um, visualization activity that went wrong and I couldn't get out of it. Um, that Finally, after hours, I managed to get my way out of it and be able to actually open my eyes and be in my body again. It was kind of this intense dissociative uh, misadventure. Um I had a friend who worked with spirits who um, was also um, kind of a problematic person and I ended up ending the friendship and uh, one night uh, I was magically attacked by something that was trying to get into my head and the way I experienced that is this is like a powerful sensation in the back of my skull and kind of the occiput and that tells me that something is trying to get in and I felt this thing trying to force its way in and I did I probably involving Thor again. Thor, Thor was great for this stuff invoked Thor and I drove it off. And then shortly thereafter, the phone rang and I answered the phone and it was this now ex friend who had called expecting to be talking to the spirits she had sent to possess me. <laughs> Only she got me, not the spirit. So that was a very, very freaky confirmation of what I was experiencing was real. She was like, did you get in? Did you get him? That would be freaky. That was very freaky. Wow. Yeah. Now, what if so. somebody calls you and says, um, Heimlich, my house is fucking haunted. I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> I've got shit going crazy. The lights are going on and off. The cabinet doors are banging. I go look and I yeah. see shadow figures, et cetera, et cetera. You know, all the craziest shit, right? Um, oh, yeah. and I know you're a magician. Please help. Yeah. What are you going to do to help these people? Uh, yeah, a couple of things. Um, I have always found salt to be a very powerful tool for dealing with um, stuff like that. Um, and putting salt, um, uh, particularly like uh, painting in salt, you know, like little hammers made out of salt. 
there was one incident where uh, I didn't have any salt. I was in, staying in this place and there was a horrible kind of thing going on. But there was a jar of Vegemite. This is back in Australia. And Vegemite is very high in salt. So I decided that Vegemite would do. Because I'm a chaos magician, right? <laughs> That's right. And, uh, Vegemite, so I painted little hammers in Vegemite on the walls and that promptly settled everything. Um, you know, you use what you got. Um the other story that comes to mind is I lived in an apartment and my housemate and I figured out we had a ghost and it would do things like in the middle of the night, it would blow open my locked door and manifest as this shadowy figure and start shrieking. And my poor cat would be terrified and ship go flying around the room. <laughs> um, and it would do it to my, my housemate as well. And we found out that someone had committed suicide in, in the apartment. Mm. So one day my housemate, prepared a beautiful, delicious dinner for two, for him and for the ghost. And he called it, and the funny thing is my housemate, total atheist, doesn't believe in any of this stuff. But he was like, I'll try anything once. I don't know where he got the idea from. But anyway, he did this. He made this meal. He served up. He laid it all out for the ghost. And he said, look, you know, we just want to be able to live in peace. Um, so if what you need is acknowledgement, then have a meal with me. And after that, we didn't have any more problems. So that was a really powerful lesson, namely that you don't always have to go in with a sledgehammer to deal with these beasts. Often, sometimes, acknowledging and giving them respect will settle them, soothe them. Um, yeah. Now, before we started, I warned you that I asked these sorts of questions, and you said you had a Ouija board yeah. story. Oh my god! <laughs> and I'm not going to let you get out of here without telling it. <laughs> so, um, actually, there's a. I think I wrote about this years ago on the El Blaze website. So the story I'm going to tell may uh, I may not remember it exactly, and people if they if they should go and read it, they might be like, "Hey, this isn't what he said." Don't worry about That's it. That's how memory I'm works, just, folks. <laughs> it was a long time ago, like nine years ago now. Ten, maybe even yeah, maybe even ten years ago. Um, so at the time I was, I was writing music reviews for this website and they sent me, they would send me music like CDs and stuff like that. And they sent this album and the album, part of the concept was that it had, um, um, what's that uh, EVP is it, you know, when you have like electronic recordings with, um, supposedly with like the voices of ghosts. Yeah. That's going recording. around with a digital voice recorder asking questions yeah. and yep, yeah, seeing yeah. what you get out of it. Yeah. Yeah, so this album had been done and they had used some of these recordings on it and they shipped it in a DVD case with a little, um, like a fold-out Ouija board just to kind of complete the thing. So um, I was like, I've never used a Ouija board. I'm curious about this thing. I'm going to give it a shot. <laughs> so um, so I, I started using it one evening and um, asking questions and so forth. And... Um, uh, I promptly found myself being told that I was having um, a conversation with some evil spirit that was, had it in for me. It was going to destroy me, which I was like, really? And then, um, and then I said, what's your name? And it said, I am called Satan. And I started laughing. Um, I just thought that was really funny. I didn't believe, I didn't believe it. I thought this is, this is some kind of game. And so, um, I'd read somewhere that you can test, you can kind of challenge a spirit by quoting a little bit of Aleister Crowley at it. And uh, I'm fond of that. Some of Aleister Crowley's stuff is just the best thing ever. Some of it's rubbish, but, you know, he's a monumental figure uh, regardless. Um, so, you know, there's that, that famous slogan, do what, do what thou wilt um, is the whole, it shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law, love under will. Um, I had read that you could you could kind of challenge uh, spirits by quoting him, quoting them the first line of that and, and seeing if they could quote the second line back. At so I just tried that and they didn't know what the, what the response was. And then I was, and somehow that shifted the dynamic of the conversation. And, um, and I was like, you're not Satan. What's going on here? And then, um, at this point I was kind of like having an out loud conversation and, and these kind of four shapes appeared around me. And they were like, yeah, you're right. We're not Satan. We're ghosts that have latched onto this, this album that's come out. 
and uh, we use it as a kind of a doorway to harass people and try and you know get power from them. And guess what? We're gonna fuck with you now. <laughs> so I said, "Oh no, you aren't." And we had a you know a kind of fairly dramatic little conflict. Um, and I kind of I had this um, wooden kind of magical sword thing that I had made that I used for ritual, and uh, I found that that seemed to stop them. And in fact, the last one, I, I, so I destroyed three of them, or I don't know if I permanently destroyed them, but whatever. The last one started to kind of float away and try to escape. And I threw the sword after it. And one of the weirdest things I've ever seen, the sword stopped in midair, the thing disappeared, and then the sword fell to the ground. Hmm. So after that, I grabbed the Ouija board, I grabbed the CD, I put it all back in the package, I sealed it all back up. And um, before I moved um, to the United States, I gave it to a very close friend who is a necromancer who exceeds me by orders of magnitude. And I, I told he knew about the story and I was like, I want you to keep this safe because it's like psychic uh, uranium. So as far as I know, he has kept it safe. And uh, yeah, that kind of weird. Right? Yeah, that, that is <laughs> quite a story. <laughs> I mean, I tell these stories, you know, and it's funny because uh, I mean, they just sound ridiculous, but, you know, with possibly me forgetting some details or whatever, but that happened. Like, I'm not exaggerating the weirdness of it. Yeah. You know, though, I don't think you can't get involved in magic in the occult for very long without sounding ridiculous. And you just sort of have to own it. I mean, you take sigils, for example, we, we yep. boil a statement of intent or a desire down to a symbol or dress it up as artistically as you want or can manage and concentrate on it until it's out of your consciousness. And then it's supposed to produce a result somewhere out in the world, you know, add in all the other things you might, might or might not do with it, but it's really something so simple and we believe we get results out of it. Why? Because we do. <laughs> yep. Yep. So, totally. um, you know, we've come towards the end of the usual broadcast and i know we've covered quite a lot of ground this has been fun and um i know you probably you're you're a very experimental magician in your approach and i've always known you to be willing to test boundaries and and explore outside the the defined realms of anything you may have previously previously identified yourself with so before we go um is there anything you're working on now that maybe we didn't cover. Um, yes, there always is something. Um, goodness, how to even begin to gather myself up. Okay. So one of the things I've become more and more interested in is, um, neurology and the neurological basis of trauma and healing processes that flow out of that and the therapeutic use of trembling. And I'm training in something called tension release exercises, um, which um, is not a spiritual practice. It's very much based in scientific uh, knowledge. Um, however, I believe that it is tapping into um, practices that um, you, know, you can read about multiple different cultures um, use to attain um, psychic uh, experiences. And I, um, I'm excited to explore that further. So I, you know, one of my interests is science and really hard science. And um, then, all right, well, let's marry up the weird with the solid and see what we can come up with. So that's something I've been really getting excited about is, is like, just, you know, how do you, how can you manipulate the nervous system? Mm -hmm. um and um yeah that's that's been a, an ongoing process um i'm getting close to the point where i'll be able to teach people how to do this technique which is exciting but the other piece is doing more experimentation with it as a magical tool which is definitely outside the box of what it's you know presented to be um but uh yeah a lot of possibilities so 
Well, if you're looking for um, test subjects or students or uh, just people to come along and experience your writing, where can people find you? So uh, lhasablaze.com. That's E-L-H-A-Z-A-B-L-A-Z-E.com. And um, we put out a book, well, as you know, um, the book is a lot of fun. It has multiple contributors. It has really amazing artwork as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I definitely would invite people to check that out. Um, and um, But you know, the website has so much stuff on it. I mean, years and years of all kinds of just stuff, interesting things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you won't really fail to find something of interest if you were to go there. Excellent. All right. Well, Heimlich, thank you again for being here. Um, It has been an absolute pleasure to get you on here finally. I've been working at it for a while. (laughs) And uh, I'll go ahead and second that. Go out and get the book, L Has a Blaze, A Compendium of Chaos Heathenry. I am not only a uh, recommending podcast host, I am also a (laughs) co-author. Uh, all right, folks. Thank you again for tuning into Weird Web Radio. As always, you can go to patreon.com slash weirdwebradio or to weirdwebradio.com and click join the membership. And for only $5 a month, you can experience all the added bonus audio where we explore really weird and sometimes morbid shit with our guests. <laughs> as always stay weird out there my friends okay gang that's a wrap on this episode of weird web radio once again thank you all for listening now it's time for you to go join the official weird web radio membership go to patreon.com slash weird web radio and you can choose your rewards and become a member today enjoy all the exclusive benefits inside information and plenty of bonus audio with each guest now you can find the show at weirdwebradio.com and weirdwebradio.libsyn.com the show is listed on facebook and twitter as weird web radio and you can find me on instagram as just lonnie underscore scott Please remember to rate and comment and share the shows that you like, and it helps others to find us in all the search results. Shoot me an email if you want to be a guest on the show, or if you know someone that would be a great guest in upcoming episodes. You can send that to weirdwebradio at gmail.com. Seek the mysteries and delights in life, my friends. As always, stay weird out there. (laughs) 